Why are we going back to the moon? The moon isn't a Dyson sphere masquerading as a celestial body or about to be destroyed by aliens. It has what amounts to no atmosphere, no liquid water, and the surface is highly irradiated because it's constantly being bombarded by solar and cosmic radiation. It is a lifeless rock in the vacuum of space, and yet Japan, South Korea, Russia, the UAE, the United States, China, India, and Europe all have plans for the moon. So why now the sudden interest? I'm Ashley Christine, and here's how it works. The only country so far that has set a literal foot on the moon is the United States, which was a three-year period beginning with the Apollo 11 mission in 1969 and ended with Apollo 17 in 1972. A few years later, in 1976, the Soviets would send Luna 24, an unmanned spacecraft, to collect samples and return to Earth. But that would be the last time anything was on the lunar surface for decades. There were a few non-landing missions, so a spacecraft that either does a flyby on its way to somewhere else like Jupiter, or it's an orbiter, so it stays in orbit around the moon collecting images and data until it crashes into the surface. In 2013, China launched Chang'e 3, and this was the first time in almost 40 years there was a spacecraft that made a soft landing on the moon, meaning that it didn't crash by accident or on purpose, it was there to explore. Named after the mythological goddess of the moon, Chang'e, it carried a solar-powered rover that took these breathtakingly eerie images. This was a big deal in 2013, especially after an anonymous user began posting first-person accounts by saying things like, I was supposed to go to sleep this morning, but before I went to sleep, my masters found some mechanical control abnormalities. China had a few more successful landers while the rest of us just watched, but it wasn't until 2022 when things really started to pick up. Historically, space programs have been government projects because, for one, nobody else could afford it, and secondly, because they were militaristic by default. A spaceship like the Saturn V rocket that carried the Apollo astronauts to the moon was designed off an ICBM, or Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. ICBMs are intercontinental, meaning they can travel to other continents. Ranges fluctuate, but usually it's with the expectation of reaching at least 3,500 miles or 5,600 kilometers. The ballistic part is where it gets interesting. A ballistic missile is one that's powered by rocket boosters in the beginning, reaches peak altitude above the atmosphere, and then essentially falls onto its target. You can see how this is pretty similar to the trajectory of a spaceship that doesn't fly like a plane so much as it launches, burns a ton of fuel, and then falls, but into orbit. ICBMs were first successfully deployed by the Soviets in 1957, which brought the first satellite, Sputnik, into space. The United States would catch up within a year, but then no one else until China 20 years later. Are you seeing the pattern here? There was a direct correlation between space programs and their country's military power. Without some version of an ICBM, going to space is impossible. You have to be able to burn hot enough fast enough to punch through the atmosphere and fight against Earth's gravitational might. Space technology is weapons technology. For any of you history buffs, you might be wondering about the German V-2 rocket during World War II. It technically wasn't considered an ICBM because of its shorter range of only about 200 miles or 320 kilometers. But the United States and the Soviet Union would still go on to steal a ton of them from German storage after the war and design their space programs after them. There was a bit of back and forth but eventually the Outer Space Treaty was signed between the United States, the UK, and the Soviet Union in 1967, and currently has 114 countries of varying commitment levels. The treaty is purposefully short and vague because it was the 1960s and no one was sure how space travel was going to turn out. But Article 4 is what we're interested in. This is where countries agree not to launch nuclear weapons into orbit, install them on celestial bodies like the Moon or Mars, or in stations. Basically, don't put the boom boom sticks in space. This is also where countries agree not to build military bases on the moon, fortifications, or weapons testing of any kind. But there are a lot of gray areas here. For example, what constitutes as a weapons test? After all, the rocket ship itself is a weapon. However, regardless of the ambiguity, the world has done a pretty decent job of keeping the peace in space. 
Scientists had suspected for a long time that there was water on the moon, but how much, where, and in what form was something everyone debated. In 1994, NASA's Clementine spacecraft was orbiting the moon when images sent to Earth suggested there was ice in one of the craters. There were a lot of stages to confirming the presence of water ice on the moon, from India's Chandrayaan mission in 2008 to NASA's L-Cross probe that purposely crashed into the surface to kick it all up. But it's generally considered as not having been truly confirmed until 2018, when all of these maps and data were fully analyzed and multiple locations of water ice were confirmed to be in the shadowed regions, particularly in the South Pole. The South Pole is where India landed their Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft last year, where NASA plans on sending astronauts within the next two years for their Artemis missions, and what will likely turn into one of the most popular regions on the moon because of the lack of sunlight that prevents ice from evaporating. The moon is tidally locked with Earth, meaning that the same side faces us all of the time, but it still rotates on its axis. It's just doing that at a rate matching Earth. So even the dark side of the moon still receives two weeks of sunlight, two weeks of darkness because the moon's rotation is 28 days. This, in addition to a very slight tilt of its rotation axis, makes the South Pole appealing because it receives less sunlight and the deep craters there are able to preserve the ancient ice. In 2020, NASA's SOFIA mission confirmed that water molecules were also in the sunlit areas. But don't get too excited about that because we're not talking about pure chunks of ice here it's spread out within the regolith. The water is in concentrations of 100 to 412 parts per million. For reference, the Sahara Desert has 100 times more water than that. You might as well extract water from cement. You might be looking at this timeline and thinking to yourself, oh, the discovery of water ice is what triggered all of these countries to want to go to the moon. But NASA had already established their plans for the Artemis program in 2017, a year before that. The discovery of water molecules wouldn't be enough on its own anyway. There could be a hundred Olympic sized swimming pools of liquid water sloshing around and it still would not be financially valuable. Scientifically, yes, it's very valuable to the STEM community, but it's not going to generate revenue. There is one resource that might be able to generate money, helium-3. Helium-3 has a rare and limited supply on Earth because it's made in the sun. And while solar winds can carry helium-3 through space to Earth, Earth's magnetic field blocks most of it. Helium-3 is used in quantum computing, medical imaging like MRIs, and could play a role in fuel for nuclear fusion reactors. If successfully extracted from the lunar regolith, it would be the only resource worth the trip because companies would pay to bring it back. But that's dependent on the technology which needs to exist first. Until such a time as the extracting methods are tested and utilized, the only entity that can really afford to go to the moon are governments because even a single mission takes years to plan. And so a space program requires a reliable, steady influx of funds, which are provided by us, the people in the form of federal taxes. Space is expensive, but there are long-term plans to try to make it cheaper. Fuel is one of the most expensive components of flight. And that's because earth is heavy and the atmosphere is thick. Mission costs fluctuate and it depends on the payload, but SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket, for example, can cost over $90 million to launch just once. And that's a reusable rocket. But the moon's gravitational pull is only a sixth of Earth's and there is essentially no atmosphere. Launching supplies for missions to Mars, for example, would be much easier to do from the moon. And pretty much all of the major countries entering this new space race have started to plan their own lunar stations. A company's motivations are a bit different. They can't collect taxes like a government so they need to generate revenue by other means. SpaceX is without a doubt a behemoth of the industry. They launched more rockets than anyone else last year with revenue estimated to be over $4 billion thanks to government contracts, being the Uber driver for the International Space Station and a delivery system for anyone looking to launch their own satellites. SpaceX plays a big role in providing support for NASA, but so does Boeing, Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin. And although some of them have designed space stations to orbit Earth or even lunar stations, there is no financial gain unless someone pays them to supply the support or technology. I know these companies like to advertise themselves as explorers changing the way we do business, but they're companies and they need to make money. As long as governments fund them, satellites need to be launched or rich people want a ride, they can stay in business. The company's motivation is directly tied to the financial incentive. So even though private companies are playing a supporting role, the race to the moon for now is a competition primarily between countries, a show of economic strength in the hopes that one day 
their investment is going to pay off. If humans become a spacefaring species exploring Mars, asteroids, and Titan, a country cannot risk being left behind. A space program is a show of longevity, technological progress, and wealth. A way for countries to say, see, I can do it too. Thank you.